So the big question tomorrow is this will, uh, except for my birthday actually officially is, is whether my wife will still love me tomorrow because you remember the old song, when I'm 64, will she still love me? <laughs> that was in my own saved days when I remember that song. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, we're in the book of Acts chapter 18 and I'd like to read the first 11 verses. And we're going to be thinking this morning about encouragement in Corinth. Now, Corinth wouldn't always be an encouragement to Paul, but at this point in his experience, this is going to be a very encouraging time for the Apostle Paul. So we'll read the first 11 verses. I'll give you an outline. We're going to be looking actually at 1 through 17, but for time's sake, I want to just read the first 11 verses. And then we'll have an outline, and then we'll get into the text. So it begins this way. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul by the night, by a vision, or in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Amen. So I want to just give you the outline. So verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at personal encouragement, how God brought encouragement to the Apostle Paul uh, in those opening five verses. Then verse 6 through 7, we're going to see Jewish opposition. And then verse 8 through 11, we're going to see divine encouragement, how the Lord himself came and encouraged Paul. <clears throat> and then 12 through 17, Jewish opposition. So you've got a kind of pattern here. Encouragement, opposition, encouragement, opposition. That's the pattern we'll see in this section. So I want to begin just by thinking of Corinth. Um, if Athens was famous for its culture, and it was, Corinth was famous for its corruption. It's moral corruption. It was a wicked city. It was 80 miles west of Athens by land or 45 miles by sea. Corinth was the capital of the province of Achaia. Its population at the time uh, of this epistle uh, is estimated to be somewhere between half a million and 700,000, which was very large uh, by any standard in the ancient world. It was comprised uh, of Greeks who were particularly attracted by the uh, the holding there every two years of the Isthmian Games. So you had the Olympic Games that were held in Greece, in Athens, they were every four years. You had the Isthmian Games in Corinth, which were second only to the Olympic Games in, in popularity that were held every two years. So that, that brought a lot of people there. A lot of industry connected with, just like today, sport is a big industry. There's a big industry in those days, too. A lot of trainers, a lot, a lot of people uh, that were involved in sport there. Uh, also, the Romans and Jews were both attracted by the commerce of the city. And it was a commercial hub because all traffic north and south in Greece came through Corinth. 
All traffic east and west came through Corinth. I mean, this is a crossroads of the ancient world and a wonderful place to establish a lampstand for the Lord Jesus Christ because people are going to be coming through all the time and they, they get a chance to hear the gospel. And so a very strategic location, an ideal place for a bridgehead for the gospel. The city was uh, famous for three things, commerce, we've already mentioned culture, and corruption. Uh, it was the location of a temple uh, devoted to Aphrodite, uh, Venus, the goddess of love, that was held up on the acro current above the city. Uh, and uh, uh, at one time, there were over a thousand temple prostitutes connected with this particular temple. And... Uh, to to go with a prostitute was not considered to be debauchery, but actually an act of devotion to the goddess. What well, became, you see, it'd be a pretty popular religion, I suppose, <laughs> because you get to indulge your flesh, and it's part of the package of devotion to the goddess. And so uh, it was a very immoral, debauched place, particularly because there were two ports. Uh, one, as you come into the isthmus, it's kind of a neck, uh, one as you come in uh, from the west, and then one as you go out from the east, right? This narrow neck. You've got two ports there. And, and so you've got sailors coming and going all the time, merchants. So you can just imagine, uh, we don't have to go into a lot of detail, but to put it this way, just as Sodom became synonymous with a sinful lifestyle, so you've got the term Sodomite, for instance, well, Corinth became synonymous with immorality. And in fact, they, for over 400 years, Corinthian was a euphemism for fornication or sexual immorality. So if you were called a Corinthian, it meant you were, uh, you were very loose in terms of your morality. So here's Paul in this city. And I want to suggest to you, now I'm going to put some evidence to my suggestion, but I want to suggest to you at this point in his missionary experience, Paul is actually somewhat discouraged. I know it's, it's kind of hard to imagine because we, we've got Paul as our superhero Christian who, you know, can, is kind of like out of the Marvel comics in terms of the Christian version. Uh, you know, he's, he's super in our mind. Uh, and yet, uh, sometimes I think we, we, we tend to put God's servants on a pedestal and assume that they don't have problems like we do. It's a big mistake. And so uh, let me give you some, uh, just a couple of examples. For instance, F.B. Mayer. I don't know if anybody's ever read anything by F.B. Mayer. He was a famous preacher in England back in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Very, very well known, wrote a lot of excellent books. But F.B. Mayer was a man who was subject to deep discouragement at times. In fact, sometimes he would get so depressed he couldn't preach. And he had, uh, on the back of his door in his office, a little placard that said this, discouragement is the worst enemy of the soul. Isn't that interesting? Spurgeon, another man we hold up in high esteem, but he also had bouts of depression uh, and times where he could not preach. There's a wonderful story. I probably told you already, but I thought it was so fabulous. Uh, one time he, he could preach, and, and the congregation uh, at Metropolitan Tabernacle knew this, and so they always had somebody ready if Spurgeon couldn't preach. And so uh, he told them I couldn't preach, and he went back to his home area, and he, he went one Sunday morning to the chapel there. Uh, somebody was preaching, and the guy was preaching one of Spurgeon's sermons. He had no idea Spurgeon was there, but the Spurgeon sermons, that they were sold every week. They, were, they went all over the world. And so this guy got one of his penny sermons, and he was preaching right from the sermon, and Spurgeon is there listening. And afterwards, the guy recognizes Spurgeon's presence, and he goes up to him, and he's all apologetic. Spurgeon says, I don't care whose sermon it was, I needed that message. And it was just the message he needed to encourage him and get him back in the pulpit. I found that very interesting. But I just want you to know that sometimes uh, servants of God, just like all of us, go through times of discouragement. And so why would I say he's discouraged? Well, let me give you some examples of why I would think so. First of all, he's alone. 
Timothy and Silas have not joined him yet. And <clears throat> Paul is a people person. He's always with somebody. Always. It's rare to see him on his own. And here he is, isolated. Not only is he on his own, he's in a strange and notoriously wicked city. And um, with all its temptations, and I know what that's like, by the way. I've been on my own in some very wicked cities. And you don't have to go looking for trouble. Sometimes trouble comes looking for you. So, so it's so there's discouragement, there's this sense of aloneness, there's the, the the wicked city he finds himself in. His funds have run out, and he needed to practice his trade as a tent maker. Now we're going to give all the biblical evidence for this. I'm just stating the facts to begin with. That he's he's no more money, and so he has to go get a job again and work as a tent maker. Also, he's just come from Athens, where the response wasn't very encouraging. If you remember, we talked about it last time, but there were three different groups. Uh, there were those that derided him. Uh, look back chapter 17, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And then there were those that delayed making a decision. Uh, it says, uh, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again in this matter. They were procrastinating. They put it on the long finger. They didn't respond. And yet, thankfully, there were some, but very few, that actually responded. Verse 34, how it bit certain men clave to him and believed among, which was Dionysius, Dionysius uh, the uh, Arapagite, uh, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So overall, in this massive city of Athens, there was a pretty sparse response. So you put all those things together. When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or chapter 2, should I say, 1 Corinthians 2, we get a little bit of a window into his spiritual condition when he went to Corinth. And again, this is his own words, but it, gives, it tells a story. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3, he says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, that's not our typical mindset of how Paul was, right? Weakness, fear, much trembling. Not super Christian Paul, surely. Yes, super Christian Paul. And super Christian Paul is really feeling his condition. Feels weak. He's trembling. He's he's got a lot of fears, and um, hardly a picture of a man full of self confidence. So we're going to learn how did God encourage His servant at this particular time, and and again, just it's good to remind ourselves, isn't it? Because if we can get this. In, this thought in our minds, I think it will be very helpful for all of us. Even the great apostle Paul sometimes struggled with discouragement. I, I find that, I actually find that encouraging <laughs> to, to recognize that, right? So, uh, because we, we have tended to put him on this pedestal. So how does God begin to encourage him? Well, first thing he does, it says in verse 2, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and come unto them. The star of Paul's encouragement was meeting a Jewish couple called Aquila and Priscilla. They recently, as we see, been expelled from Rome by the Emperor Claudius. Now, it's very interesting because if you look into secular history, you'll learn why the Jews were kicked out of Rome. And this occurred in AD 49. It's well documented. And one Roman historian, uh, Suetonius, wrote, Claudius banished the Jews from Rome because they were indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus. Who do you think Crestus might be? It's another misspelling of Christ. And so what was going on is what we have seen as we've gone through the book of Acts. 
the gospel is presented in their synagogue, and usually the Jews get really irate and they cause riots. Well, the gospel had come to Rome, and guess what was happening? The Jews got upset, and there's a riot uh, amongst them in Rome, and so this seems to be the, the case. It seems that the expulsion has to do with dissension and disorder within the Jewish community of Rome resulting from the introduction of Christianity into one or more of the synagogues of the city. The other thing that's interesting to me is that twice Luke, both in his gospel and here now in the book of Acts, tells us how God used Roman emperors in their edicts and decisions for his purposes. Luke's gospel chapter 1. There's a decree made by Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Do you remember that? And as a result of that, he got Joseph and Mary to make the trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Is that God sovereignly using government to fulfill his purposes? Now he says, I've got a servant discouraged right here in the city of Corinth, and he needs encouragement. Who can I move to get to encourage him? Well, okay. Uh, let's expel all the Jews from Rome so that Aquila and Priscilla will show up in Corinth just at the time when he needs encouragement. Mm -hmm. Good to know, isn't it, that God is in control of the affairs of men. Amen. And governments. That should give us some encouragement. And so it would seem, at least uh, to many, that Aquila and Priscilla were already believers. When Paul met them, because surely Luke would have told us of their conversion story in the workshop if, if they had just got saved there. It seems that not only they were Jews, they were Jews who had already believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and as well they happened to be tent makers. And so they have the same faith, the same ethnicity, and the same career. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. He brings people just at the right particular time. And of course, uh, tent makers, sometimes they said they were leather workers, but, but primarily the idea of tent makers is ideal. It's a good way of describing it. And of course, when we think of a tent maker, we we'll think of people living in tents. We think of a nomadic lifestyle, don't we? Remember Abraham, he's a stranger and pilgrim. He lives in a tent. He's always on the move. Well, if ever there was a couple who had a career that was fitting to their lifestyle, it's a quiller of the soul because they've always got different addresses. They're always on the move, but they're always on the move for the cause of the gospel. And they are, they are absolutely a marvelous couple. In fact, they're not just going to be an encouragement for Paul now. They're going to be an encouragement for the rest of his ministry. Amen. They're going to really be, uh, you would say, key individuals, key workers. <laughs> Uh, in the in the, the establishment of New Testament churches throughout the empire. In fact, next time we speak on Acts, we'll be looking at Aquila and Priscilla straightening out a guy called Apollos. And not in Corinth anymore. They'll be in Ephesus. So we're going to see them moving around. They're going to be, well, they started out in Rome. They're expelled from Rome. They go to Corinth. Then they go to Ephesus. And then we're going to see them back in Rome again. <laughs> And then we're going to see them back in Ephesus again. Like, can these guys ever settle down? I mean, they're always moving. But everywhere they move, it seems like there's a church that meets in their house. Amazing. They're, they're amazing. Couple. In fact, let's just look at some of the references to them just quickly. Look at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19. This lovely list of greetings. And he says... The churches of Asia salute you. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So he's now writing to the Corinthians. Uh, and as he writes to the Corinthians, he says, of course, clearly they're not in Corinth anymore. Uh, he's sending greetings from Rome where he's writing to the Corinthians. And guess where the church is meeting? In their house. Romans 16. Romans chapter 16. 
and verse 3. Romans 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So now they're clearly back in Rome. Obviously, the, the edict has been rescinded because this Jewish couple now find themselves back in Rome again. And he sends greetings to them as he writes to the church in Rome. And he says, they're my helpers in Christ Jesus. And then one more reference in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19. Second Timothy 4, 19. The little greetings at the end of the epistle are always fascinating. Salute Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. And again, uh, just another example of this great, great couple that was such a blessing to the Apostle Paul. And so, just uh, what an encouragement to find some people who had so much in common and could be such an encouragement to Paul. He says, because they were of the same craft, verse 3, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation there were tent makers. So, clearly, same craft, stay, stay in the same house, same faith, uh, same ethnicity, uh, great encouragement. And oftentimes, we might just say this, that God uses his people to be the encouragers we need. Not every day that you get God himself coming and encouraging like Paul got later on in the chapter. Most times, our encouragement comes from fellow believers. We just come alongside at the right time when we need it and bring a word of encouragement or share the same convictions. And it's just like, it just kind of helps us to press on and keep going despite discouragement. And so we, we need to recognize that, that as our world becomes increasingly anti-Christian, we're going to need one another more and more. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, as we come to the meeting, <laughs> We may not have any particular responsibilities. We might not have Sunday school. We might not have, you know, kind of preaching responsibility. We might not have any responsibilities assigned, but we do have, every one of us have a responsibility to encourage one another in the Lord. Right? And try to be an encouragement to one another. And pray, Lord, is there somebody, maybe there's somebody in my assembly this morning who's really discouraged who needs a word of encouragement. Lord, give me the sensitivity of your spirit to know who he is or who she is and how to be an encouragement to them. Right? Have that mindset. And so, Paul certainly was not a uh, isolationist. Um, uh, he was a team player. Uh, he's not a lone ranger. And like all of us, he needed encouragement from his fellow believers. So as a result of this encouragement, we notice verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So he goes back to his, his usual habit of starting with the Jew first. And it's kind of, the language here is very interesting. Both reasoned uh, and persuaded in verse 4 are interesting words. The word reasoned here is the word dialogued. It's the kind of cut and thrust of debate. And so uh, he, he, he loved this kind of Cut and thrust debate. He wasn't just giving lectures. Uh, he, he, he loved the debate. He loved the discussion. It's kind of like the midweek Bible reading, you know. Don't you just love some of the cut and thrust and discussion rather than just a lecture? Well, that's the idea. Uh, that's how he taught. He, he, there was discussion. There was debate. There was dialogue. And then persuasion means the idea of prevailing upon people to make a decision. And again, the, I think there's a reason to, to do that, right, to, do something with what you're hearing. Don't just be uh, kind of just sit there like a bump on a log. Respond to the word of God, encouraging people to do that. And so uh, as he did this, reason with the Jews from their own scriptures, dialogue with them, cut and thrust of debate, try to persuade them. Once again, there's a bit of intransigence amongst the Jews. They, they don't seem to respond very well. We'll see that in a moment. But look, notice verse 5. God brings even more encouragement to his servant. Verse 5, when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So, more encouragement, the arrival of Silas and Timothy fresh from Macedonia. 
And two reasons why their arrival from Macedonia was encouraging to Paul. First of all, they brought some good news concerning how the Christians were doing in Thessalonica. That was very heavy on Paul's heart. He was, he was anxious about their well-being. He left them in the midst of persecution and riot. And he's told us before, or at least in 2 Corinthians, he tells us the greatest trial that he ever endured was the care of the churches. And so he's, he's really anxious about their well-being. And he hasn't heard anything. And he left them in this this cauldron situation, and when Silas and Timothy come, they bring him good news from Thessalonica. How do we know that? Look at 1 Thessalonians. And again, we're not making this, this up. We're just putting the evidence together, comparing Scripture with Scripture, and getting a clear picture of what's going on. And so 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, it says this, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. It's almost like, Lord, I can breathe again now. I know they're doing all right. Like a sigh of relief to know that these were doing well. But not only did they come, with good news from Thessalonica, they also came with a financial gift from Philippi. How do we know that? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, and verse 15. We read these lovely words. He says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. But even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my necessity, not because I desire to give, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account, and so on and so forth. So a gift comes from Philippi, and uh, this again, was a huge encouragement to him. Again, where do we get more evidence for that? Second Corinthians chapter 11. Just putting things together here, trying to make sense of the passage. And uh, again, we're so thankful as you compare scripture with scripture, you get a clear picture of things. So Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, more on this gift that came to him. When he was in Corinth, 11 verse 9, it says this, uh, verse 8, I robbed of the churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, so I meant financial want, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, so will I keep myself. So brethren came from Macedonia bringing a gift, freeing him up, and now that he's freed up, what does he do? Uh, he said, uh, again, verse 5 of, of Acts 18, Paul, blessed in the Spirit, testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. It's almost like uh, we put it today, he's got his mojo back. He's kind of, he's really given it to them now. He's blessed in the Spirit, preaching to the Jews. Uh, some uh, translations uh, have the idea that he devoted himself exclusively to preaching. And, and so the idea is uh, he's testifying, he's proclaiming to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But as we said, it doesn't always go down well with the Jews to hear this message. In verse 6, it says, when they abhorred themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment, said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean from henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles. So this increased effort by Paul was certainly not appreciated by the Jews. They opposed him and it says they blasphemed. Now, again, this idea of blaspheming, the, the Jews would never ever speak ill of the God of the Old Testament, would they? they, they, they would, in a synagogue, they would never say that. So who are they blaspheming? Jesus the Christ. Which again is one of these indirect 
declarations to us, and there's so many of them, of the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus, because you can only blaspheme a divine person, and they would never blaspheme that God the Father, or, or God be revealed in the Old Testament, but they certainly had no problem in blaspheming that blessed person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, again, they, they, they oppose, they blaspheme. And so how does Paul respond? He said, well, um, he says, he shook his raven. Remember the Lord Jesus talked about shaking the dust off your feet. But he shook the dust off his, he didn't even want his garment stained with the, the synagogue and their, their rejection of his Savior and their blasphemous speech concerning uh, the eternal Son who ever lived in the bosom of the Father. So he, on the one hand, uh, shows his rejection of their rejection by shaking, uh, as it were, the very dust from his garments. And then he makes this quite shocking statement, your blood be upon your own heads. And it takes us back to Ezekiel. And we won't, we won't look at the references. I'm going to give you them. Uh, or you can listen to a message recently on YouTube on Ezekiel mm -hmm. chapter 3, uh, which talks about blood guiltiness. And the idea is, if it's to do with a watchman, and a watchman has a responsibility to warn, and if people, if he fails to warn them, and, and an enemy comes on the city, then their blood is on his hands. Paul says, I, my, my hands are clean. I have warned you, I have taught you, I've given you the message, and you, you have not listened to the warning, you have not, you've ignored the watchman, your blood is on your own head. Of course, in AD 70, uh, the Jews are going to be scattered all over the world. There's going to be tremendous stuff because they didn't listen to the warning. And so, uh, by the way, in Acts 20, he's going to say the very same thing again. He, he really took this idea of being a watchman pretty seriously. Acts 20 and uh, verse... Uh, 26 and 27, he says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So very dramatic words in his testament. Verse 7, he said, He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house, named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. You've heard the saying, one door closes, another door opens. Well, in this case, the door that opened was right next door. Imagine that. And by the way, imagine uh, the awkwardness. Because some of the Jews and some of the, uh, the, uh, the devout Gentiles who attended the synagogue are now going to the new meeting right next door. <laughs> And so you can imagine if their time was the same, it would be pretty embarrassing, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, seeing them go to different buildings uh, on, the, on the same day. Uh, but uh, certainly there would have been some tension in the air. But in the midst of all of this Jewish opposition, there's a very notable trophy of grace. And again, what an encouragement this must have been, because it tells us in verse 8, and Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So not only do you have encouragement of the gift coming, of the, uh, the good news of Thessalonica, of this couple, Quiller and Priscilla, and now you have, you have the encouragement of a great response to the gospel. Mm -hmm. All these people getting saved, including the chief ruler of the synagogue and his whole family. That must have been something, wasn't it? I mean, what a blow to the synagogue. This is their head guy, and all of a sudden, he's defected. He's accepted Jesus is the Christ. And by the way, I've only missed the pattern here. And it's a beautiful pattern in verse 8. But it says, many of the Corinthians, and I want you to notice language, hearing, believed, were baptized. That's, that is the scriptural formula in the New Testament. Hearing, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, 
believing, right, where you put your entire trust for all eternity in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. You believe it, you hear it, you, you put your trust in him, and then you show that you believed it by being baptized. He said, oh, what an encouragement. And by the way, they really are encouraging times. Remember when we were in Ireland and we had a, a number of people get saved and we had a baptism and it was in a public way pool. It was a bit of all the details, but it was, a, it was a phenomenal day. And I remember afterwards, there was a few of us, we were, we were just talking. It was like, we were just on cloud nine. We were so encouraged. There's nothing more encouraging than seeing people saved and baptized and come into fellowship in most gospel. It's so wonderful. And so you can see uh, that there's a great encouragement here. By the way, one of the one of the few people that Paul actually baptized was this man, Crispus. Wait and notice First Corinthians chapter 1 again, please. Because generally speaking, he didn't baptize. <clears throat> he says, um, verse 13, he said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I am baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. But Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or words, lest the cross of Christ should be made not effect. Yeah. I've only just mentioned it. This is a really important passage. Because what it tells us is that baptism is essential for obedience, but it's not essential for salvation. Amen. God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay? And so the gospel is belief in the finished work of Christ on Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his claims to be the Son of God. The gospel is concerning our trust in him and his finished work. We show we believe that by obedience in baptism, but it's not the gospel. Now, in my humble opinion, if somebody gets saved, they should get baptized. baptized. I don't think there should be a delay. I think probationary baptism is, dare I say it, tradition and not truth. In the New Testament, somebody got saved. They, go, they didn't wait to see how they're going to pan out. We better just watch this guy. You know, he's got a dodgy past. We better just keep an eye on him. That is not how it happened in the New Testament. Somebody believed these Corinthians. Do you think any of them had a dodgy background? <laughs> Don't you? But based on the city, they probably all had a dodgy background. But they believed and they were baptized. So now, now notice now verse 9. I'm going to just read um, a few verses together here. Uh, 9 through 11, because they go together beautifully. It says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God amongst them. If he's not encouraged enough at this point, and I, I think he's getting a bit more encouraged by all these events. I mean, would you be encouraged by all these? I think you would, wouldn't you? Now you talk about the ultimate encouragement. It don't get better than this. The Lord himself appears in a vision in the night to our, our apostle. And uh, he gets a direct word of encouragement from the Lord himself. And he promised him three things. He promised him his presence. But what a wonderful promise is that. He says, I'll be with you. Promises his protection. Nobody's going to hurt you. Now, that would mean a lot. If you, you, you've been following up to now, right? I mean, he's been stoned. He's been left for dead. He's had riots several times. You know, he, 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 this would be a great encouragement to know you're going to be safe in Corinth. It's a wicked city. What an assurance. No man, he says, it's going to hurt thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Then, not only his presence, not only his protection, but his promise of power. See, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And the Lord says, I have many or much people 
in this city. What that means is, God in his foreknowledge knows who's going to get saved before they ever respond to the gospel. Never a surprise to him. He knew before the world began who would respond and who would reject. Like nothing's a, a, a new idea to him. Right? He knows the end from the beginning. Foreknowledge is an attribute of God. He knows beginning from the end. And so he knows that actually this wicked city is going to be a great place for a rich head for the gospel. And many are going to get saved. And, and not only does he know all that, God also knows that where sin abounds, grace does super abound. And in the wicked city of Corinth, we're going to see that. There's going to be a lot of amazing conversions. And so the solution to Paul's fear and he did have fear. We saw that in, in 1 Corinthians 2. Was He says, do not be afraid, but speak and hold not your peace. Let him have it. Give him the word of God, Paul. Don't pull back. You just keep preaching. You keep preaching this message. And there will be a response. Because I have much people in this city. And I know who's going to believe. And so he continued there a year and six months. And uh, that's kind of the longest stay so far. He's going to be a longest stay in Ephesus. This is the longest day he's ever been anywhere. 18 months. Teaching the word of God amongst them. And let's just look at again at 1 Corinthians and see what some of these much people in this city look like. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusing themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Mm -hmm. And so in this wicked city, God saves people out of all these, these backgrounds of immorality. And he says, such were some of you. They're not continuing in those lifestyles. They've been cleaned up. Their lives have been transformed by the preaching of the gospel. <clears throat> I would suspect that the testimony meeting in the city of Corinth would be an exciting meeting to attend. <laughs> you imagine hearing some of these testimonies? So God did a marvelous work encouraging his servant. Now, you just quickly go down verses 12 through 17. More opposition. And again, it, it comes from the same source, Jewish opposition, when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia. The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul. Just like it happened in Rome, it's happening in Corinth now. Brought into the judgment seat. By the way, uh, when Paul talked to the Corinthians about we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, they know what he was talking about because there was a beam of seat in Corinth. And he was... They were brought before it, this beam of seed. So they, they knew exactly uh, what he was talking about. And so they brought up the judgment seat saying, the fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if he wouldn't even let Paul speak, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, for ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, but I will be no judge of such matters. In other words, the, the Supreme Court in Corinth refused to hear the case. And the reason this is so significant, and it really is significant, if Galilee had accepted the Jewish charge and found Paul guilty of the alleged offense, provincial governments everywhere would have had a problem. Paul's ministry would have been severely restricted. Yet, Galileo's refusal to act was like recognizing Christianity as a legitimate thing. So this was a huge court decision not to accept their accusation uh, that he was preaching something unacceptable or unorthodox. And so, he, notice it ends up, he drove them from the judgment seat. Then oh, verse 17, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue. It's the chief ruler number two. 
beat him before the judgment seat. The Galio cared for none of these things. It would seem to me, just kind of summarizing, that probably Galio and the, and the mob were more against the Jews than they were for Paul. In other words, anti-Semiticism is not a new thing. It's been around a long, long time. But one last thing. We're at noon now. So we're going to give you the last little nugget here, which I find very interesting. And that is this. This Sosthenes, this chief ruler of the synagogue number two, they beat him before the judgment seat. And I expect that that beating knocked a bit of sense into Sosthenes. Because when you look at 1 Corinthians again, chapter 1, in verse 1, you read a very remarkable statement. He says, all called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Amen. Wow. Seems like it's a dangerous position to hold. <laughs> To be the chief ruler of the synagogue. It seems like you've got a target on your back, and the gospel arrow is about to get bullseye because number one's gone, now number two is gone. Again, what an encouragement. What a blow to the synagogue community. What another marvelous gain for the gospel. So, as we wrap up, how do we end this? Well, let me just say this. Simple question for all of us. Are you an encourager? <laughs> Encourage means to literally to, to give courage. Maybe people who are feeling like they lack courage, they, they feel a bit kind of overwhelmed. And you come along, just the right word at the right time, and all of a sudden they've got courage back again. To walk with the Lord. And then don't assume that useful servants of God don't ever experience discouragement. Beware of putting people on a pedestal. Because we've said it many times from this pulpit, I'm going to say it again. The best of men are men at best. And we're all made. Of the same material. And so we need all of us from time to time, we all need a strong dose of encouragement. Amen. God help me to be an encourager of the saints. A refresher of the saints. An encourager is to make a difference in the life of somebody, even in their day, that gives them a bit of hope and encouragement. In a, in a world that can get you really discouraged if you're not careful. <laughs> it can really drag you down. Let's be encouraged. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful again for the practicality of the Word of God. Every time we look at it, we just we can't help but think how marvelous your Word is. Lord, help us all to examine our own hearts so we encourage us. Is there someone we need to encourage today, some way? by pulling alongside them, showing love to them, um, showing that we care about them, care about what they're going through. We care about their trials and difficulties of life. Lord, help us in these things. Encourage us as well in terms of the gospel. Lord, we'd love to see the kind of thing you did in Corinth, you do in our wicked sin, in that you save precious, precious souls and add them to the assembly from all different backgrounds. And what a joy that would be to our souls. What an encouragement that would be. So we look to thee to help us in these things in that lovely, fragrant name of the one who does not get discouraged. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.